Hello, Nutrition 115 students, and welcome to Unit 24, or Chapter 24 in your book, Dietary Supplements. So let's define dietary supplements. Um, they are any products intended to supplement the diet, but do not replace an actual diet of whole solid foods. Examples are vitamins and mineral supplements, proteins, enzymes, and amino acids, mm -hmm. Fish oils and fatty acids, hormones and hormone precursors, herbs and other plant extracts, and prebiotics and probiotics. It can be a single, um, a dietary sub can be a combination of these, or um, they can occur um, in si as single items as well. And then such uh, products have to be labeled as dietary supplements according to the Food and Drug Administration. And I do want to let you know. Also, that uh, they are not intended to prevent, treat, um, or cure any disease. Uh, these disparate products are also grouped together because they are regulated as foods and not drugs. About half of the U.S. adults use one or more dietary supplement products available on the market, especially uh, multi-minerals and some type art minerals. So. Usually supplements related to a mineral or multi-minerals in general are the ones that are mostly or widely used. Also, I want you to know that in 1994, Congress passed the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which started the explosion in the availability of dietary supplements. And then under this act, also, dietary supplements are minimally regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. They're actually more minimally regulated than, than actual nutrition facts panel or food labels for food. So supplements are regulated worse. They usually go by the golden rules. So they, uh, they do have regulations and guidelines and policies that manufacturers have to abide by uh, listed on their website um, and also in their, um, um, in their mission statement as far as to the manufacturers. But they kind of use the golden standard and leave it up to the manufacturers to follow those guidelines, rules, and policies and regulations. Um, I want you to know that supplements do not have to be tested prior to to uh, prior to marketing or to, uh, and proved to be shown uh, to be safe or effective for the human population. Um, and although they do advertise to relieve certain elements, they are not considered to be drugs once again. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that they're not subjected to rigorous testing to prove safety and effectiveness prior to the cell. Okay. Um, so make sure you take note of those important um, facts. Dietary supplements are supposed to supplement the diet again, not replace a wholesome diet. They are not intended, like I mentioned before, to prevent cure um, or treat any disease. Uh, they are regulated as foods and not as drugs once again. And this is from your books, but these are some very common dietary supplements and some main types of them. So vitamins and minerals tend to be some of the top ones that uh, consumers purchase. Herbs, um, and it's an example is ginkgo, ginseng, and St. John's worth. A lot of them are meant to help with mental clarity. Um, proteins and amino acids as well. We see that a lot in the athletic fields. Hormone and hormone precursors are usually that's um, popular with people with diseases and athletes and so on and so on. And we'll cover some of these few that it's straight from your book. Also, supplements are deemed unsafe um, only when the FDA has proven that they are harmful. So a lot of times when they prove that they are harmful, they've already been on the market and it's had some kind of effect on humans harmful effect and it's been reported. So when it once it's reported, then they'll be pulled off the shelves. Uh, to, uh, and, and sometimes they will, um, the federal government will, the federal go or some entities of government, like the uh, Federal Trade Commission, will work with the Food and Drug Administration to have them comply by removing the harmful substance or just in, in altogether eradicating the product and not selling it at all. But if they come, um, if they are able to um, a remedy what is wrong with their with their product or supplement, they can then put it back after they have been able to comply. Okay, so the FDA largely relies on reports of ill effects from manufacturers, health professionals, and like I mentioned, the consumers to assess their safety. Okay. And like I mentioned before, in 1994, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act was passed by Congress, and it um, it allowed the Food and Drug Administration to oversee supplements that are sold to consumers, but again, they're minimally and poorly scrutinized and regulated. 
They are not tested or shown to be safe or effective. So they do not have to be tested prior to being marketed or sold to the consumer. They don't have to be proven safe or effective. Uh, responsibility for safety lies with the manufacturer. Once again, the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA does have some great regulations and guidelines that manufacturers have to follow, but uh, that responsibility that lies within them usually is broken, okay? Um, a supplemental facts panel is required by the FDA. And again, it's just like the, the it's, it's, it, it's synonymous to the food label um, on food. So um, it's like a supplement um, label. It's called a supplemental facts panel. Qualifying products can be labeled with a health claim. And these health claims, there's only certain health claims that are approved by the FDA. And again, manufacturers have to make sure they know what those approved ones are. Um, a health claim, I just want to let you know, usually um, um, expresses a nutrient or a substance in the supplement and it ties it to a health and condition. For example, you may find if you take a calcium supplement that it says, it states calcium may decrease the risk of osteoporosis or the effects of osteoporosis. So they have to have may, um, um, may the word may in it as well, again, because they don't, they're not proven to cure or disease or um, uh, treat a disease. Um, and again, a health claim usually has a nutrient or substance that ties it to a health or condition. So in this case, the calcium is the nutrient or substance. And then if um, the, the, the claim that it's making is that it, it decreases osteoporosis or the risk of it. Side effects are not required to be stated by the manufacturer. Um, a lot of times it's up to the consumer to um, educate themselves about the, the ingredients in a supplement and the side effects, whether through the internet or by calling the manufacturer for a list. Supplements can also be labeled with a structure function claim. The difference between a structure function claim and a health claim is a structure function claim um, still uh, expresses or states something about a nutrient or, or substance in the supplement, uh, but instead of, it does not tie it to a disease or condition, it just ties it to a basic human function or biological function. For example, let's take the calcium again. A structure function claim for calcium could be calcium may build strong bones. Again, it's not saying anything about a disease, it's just merely stating that everyone needs strong bones. These claims cannot refer to a disease or prevention, um, to disease prevention or treatment effects. Again, structure function claims don't tie something to a disease or condition. Those are health claims. And this is straight from your book. So it's the Food and Drug Administration regulations for supplement labeling. So some things that the supplemental label or panel must include is product must be labeled as a dietary supplement. The product must have a supplemental facts label that includes the serving size, the amount of the product per serving, the percent daily value of key nutrients of public health significance, a list of other ingredients, and the manufacturer's name and address so if the consumer wants to contact them regarding concerns. Uh, they can have nutrient claims. Um, a nutrient claim, it just basically states that it has a nutrient. It can say high or low in a certain nutrient, like high in fiber or low in sodium. A list of ingredients in the supplement. Uh, again, we talked about structure function claims and health claims can also be expressed. Um, the FDA disclaimer must appear, however, when these claims are made that it is, it is not meant to or intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And claims and FDA disclaimer. So here is an ultra omega-3 supplement. Um, and I just pointed out some things. So it has a suggested usage, a qualified health claim on it as well. It says here the omega-3 fatty acids may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. It has a functional description of the omega-3. There's a disclaimer of the FDA stating that it's not meant to or intended to diagnose or treat anything like heart disease. It has some cautions, um, and then it has like the actual size of the soft gel. And as you see here on the front, um, it has a structure function claim, supports brain health. Uh, so it's just merely stating that it supports something functional in the human body. And you can go on and on and uh, break this down, um, but uh, make sure you can pause it and just take a look at it. Um, again, I also have here that allergen information should be stated as well. Regulation of dietary supplements uh, continued. So this is straight from your book. So this is just a depiction of consumer beliefs about dietary supplement versus reality. So consumers tend to believe the following. Uh, 
um, that they have accurate health claims, they are approved by the FDA, they will improve and help maintain health, they are safe, quality, and effective. And as, and as, as, as you're learning through my lecture, that's not true. So you can go ahead and look at this table in your book about the common misconceptions or beliefs that consumers have versus what reality is, okay? Multi-mineral and mineral supplements again are among the top that are sold um, by consumers. So they are they represent again the most popular type of dietary supplement, and 33% of Americans report using them mostly on a daily basis. There we go. Here's the percentage. So 33% of Americans use vitamin and mineral supplements. A vitamin or mineral is indicated when a deficiency exists. Uh, use is related to improved health among individuals at risk of developing a deficiency due to a particular disease or condition. So again, this is the best way to use supplements is when you are at risk of a deficiency because you have a poor diet or a certain condition that doesn't allow you to absorb nutrients in a certain manner, then a supplement can be uh, probably a good thing. And most of us fall into this category because we are deficient in many food groups and many foods. So most of us are okay with the daily vitamin, which um, are usually under uh, the daily requirement that one needs. So it allows for room for you to get um, some of your nutrients from foods. Multi-minerals and multivitamins usually have um, amounts more than the recommended dietary allowance that you need daily. So it's above 100%. It means more than 100% of a certain vitamin or mineral that you need a day. So those can run a little higher. Um, and I usually recommend um, maybe taking a multi-mineral, because again, the, the, the nutrient amounts are higher for them, maybe weekly if you have a very poor diet or an athlete. But other than that, you should be attempting to get your uh, nutrients from foods and maybe taking a daily supplement just to fill in some of the smaller gaps, okay? But always, always, um, I recommend doing some type of a food analyzation, which you guys have done for your um, for your diet in my class, we did a diet assignment to assess some of those vitamins and minerals to see if you actually need a supplement. The best way to determine is to first analyze your diet. A serious consequence of supplements results when they are used as a remedy for health problems that can be treated by medicine, but not by vitamins or minerals. Okay, and then the rationale, the rationale use of vitamins and minerals, again, like all medications, Vitamin and mineral supplements should be taken only if medically indicated. If they are taken, doses, uh, dosages should not be excessive, okay, by any means. And I actually recommend to some people um, that when they start certain supplements, that they, they start with half the dose that is recommended on the food label, on the supplemental facts label, like, just to see if they have any type of reaction to it. But always check with the doctor, especially if you're taking medications. If you're someone that takes medications in here, you should definitely always consult with the doctor when you take any vitamin or, or any supplement, I should say, okay? Vitamin and mineral supplements, enough is as good as a feast. So who may benefit from vitamin and mineral supplements? Here are some examples. I kind of named some already. So people diagnosed with a vitamin deficiency or a mineral deficiency, uh, newborns, again, they cannot make vitamin K because their gut hasn't produced that ability yet. People live in areas without fluoridated water, so like fluoride, vegans who may be deficient in B12 and D, people experiencing blood loss, um, loss of iron, people at risk for osteoporosis due to low calcium intake and poor vitamin D status, and individuals with the impaired absorption of, of, to be able to process uh, vitamin B12 in the gut or in the stomach. Um, uh, so before I go on, who else? I maybe made some recommendations. So pregnant women or women wanting to be pregnant um, in the stages of pre-pregnancy are usually recommended to take an additional 400 uh, micrograms of folate, folic acid, um, to uh, decrease neural tube defects. If you're an athlete, I also recommend uh, taking um, um, an amino acid. If you have high volume training, there's an amino acid called glutamine. Uh, you should probably consider taking that. It's usually non-essential, but because um, athletes with a high volume of training weekly, um, it can put extra stress on their joints and the need for uh, glutamine can be a little higher, okay? Uh, so those are just a few other populations. Um, extracts, so let's talk about herbs. So herbs uh, or herbal remedies also, known, also fall into the supplement category are also called botanicals, have been used in traditional medicine in China and India for over 5,000 years, so thousands and thousands of years. And then many, this one's the one that many people think that are the best, 
and the safest because they usually uh, have this unrealistic approach or perspective that it's uh, from natural components of plants and have been used in traditional medicine for a long time, but not all plants are safe. Some plants can be poisonous to humans, such as mistletoe berries, for example, and oleander. Um, and did you guys know that orchids can also be uh, poisonous to kids? Okay, so certain flowers as well, okay, and other herbs out there. And a definition, again, is right here, extracts or other preparations made from ingredients of plants intended to prevent, alleviate, or treat, or to promote health. Uh, used in traditional medicine, like I mentioned before, in India and China for over 5,000 years. So I just have it here on the slides. Uh, discovery of the properties of these plant-based substances led to about half of the drugs used today. So herbs are very, very uh, popular in the supplemental field. Modern medicine has decreased the historic reliance on herbal uh, remedies. And then about 20% of U.S. adults used diet, herbal dietary supplements. And there's this huge alternative medicine branch called uh, complementary alternative medicine called CAM and that's usually people who um, have a little bit of a, a indifference to Western medicine and so they have they want alternatives and they usually will uh, look at things like herbs and supplements and whole foods to see how they can treat or help manage a disease. However many products sold as herbal remedies in the U.S. have drug-like effects on body function so I also want you to know that okay. Um, Approximately 20% of adults, like I said here, you should know that for the test, use herbal remedy supplements each year. So I just want to repeat that because that's a huge percentage. I usually thought it was lower. I thought it was more like 10%, uh, but I got reminded that it's a little higher. And then the quality of herbal products, many herbal products available in the market are of poor quality. Some of the products have been found to contain ingredients other than those declared on the label including banned drugs and some contain contaminants such as bacteria molds mercury and lead so make sure you note that as well okay i want you to know just for example analysis of the composition of 25 ginseng products uh, for example found that concentrations of ginseng compounds in the supplements were up to 36 times different than the labeled amounts and that's another big thing guys is i also re read a lot of consumer reports and based on some consumer reports of what is actually on a supplemental food la uh, supplemental label is not what is in the pill. So there's mismatches as well. So here are some examples of some herbal remedies. Um, ginger, garlic, uh, echinacea, um, and then other things that you see here as well. Um, according to your book, uh, echinacea, which you see here, in the pink um, flowers, a garlic, ginkgo biloba, um, St. John's wort, and ginger is what you see here, are some of the most common ones. Um, and again, there's also some safety concerns. For example, echinacea. Uh, echinacea is often used uh, to diminish upper respiratory infection and also allergic reactions. And safety concerns are that people allergic to ragweed who have an autoimmune disorder or on drugs that affect liver function should not use this herb. Garlic too um, may decrease blood pressure to a small extent, so it, it could be a good contributor to helping regulate blood pressure. But a safety concern is it may decrease blood clotting in or, and interact with blood thinners if you are on blood thinners. So that's an example of why you should always check with your physician. Effectiveness and safety of herbal remedies, I think I covered this a little bit. Um, herbal remedies have biologically active ingredients that can be positive can have positive, negative, or neutral effects on body processes. Again, they can be contaminated as well. And what is in the food may not be on the label and vice versa. A herbal remedy is considered valuable if it has beneficial effects on health and is safe. Knowledge of the risks and benefits of many herbal supplements remains quite incomplete. There needs to be more research on the negative effects and risks of herbal supplements so that we have more education on that. Um, and then we were going to see a video. Um, I'm going to see if I'm able to post it on your learning unit. Uh, sometimes some videos require a subscription. So if, if it seems like it's a subscription, I'm going to double check. Then I cannot post it. But if it's something that is open to the public, I can go ahead and post it. So this is from your book, Effectiveness and Safety of Herbal Remedies. I actually just went through this. So I mentioned some of the safety concerns of some common um, herbal uh, supplements, um, their effectiveness, and also their safety concerns. It's straight from your book. 
These are examples, another table from your book, of dietary supplements that may not be effective or safe. Um, there's just not enough research um, to be proven, um, but there's a lot of just human um, theory um, that they may be. Um, usually cultural based, so um, here are a few from your book. Quality of herbal products continue. Again, I mentioned ma many on the market are of poor quality. Um, and here it is, some have been found to contain ingredients other than those listed on the label, and they can be uh, addictive, and they can be banned. Um, I'll give you an example, but I was working with a um, paraprofessional boxer one time in Sacramento. Um, he was training for a boxing match, and he's overseen by the U.S. Uh, USA um, drug um, organization to be tested. And he was banned from uh, competing because he had found to have high levels of a certain substance in his blood. And I did not know that because I, I literally um, was his nutritionist. I knew exactly what supplements he was taking, what, what were in his supplements, what foods he was in taking. And it, I thought it was impossible. So um, like my instinct and expert, expertise came in and I was right. I called the manufacturer and it happened to me that one of the herbal supplements uh, that he was taking uh, contain trace amounts of that ingredient and it showed up in his blood, but it was not listed on the label. Okay. Um, some contain contaminants, like I mentioned before, and I have it on the slide. Some are commonly recalled. Um, so I would have to say out of all the supplement supplemental uh, products out there, herbal products have been one of the most common that have been recalled from the market because they contain unlisted prescription drugs. There is no government body that monitors the content of herbal supplements. Again, they can be pulled off the shelves if they're proven to be unsafe um, and reported to the Federal and uh, Trade Commission. So um, some things that you can look for um, since supplements are poorly regulated, some um, manufacturers do hire private organizations to uh, conduct uh, testing on their products. And one of them is you can look for USP seal and a, a consumer lab um, seal. These symbols on the uh, labels of dietary supplements certify quality ingredients and accurate labeling, but do not assess product safety or effectiveness. So I just want to emphasize they do not claim when you see these um, symbols on a supplement you buy, it's not saying that their ingredients are safe and effective and all natural and organic. What it's stating most likely is more for honesty and purity, meaning that what the consumer manufacturer says is in the pill and on the supplement label, it matches. And purity as far as uh, whatever is listed on the ingredient list is exactly what's in the pill and nothing more and nothing less. Um, for example, some whey protein powder can have bird feathers milled as a filler to give this fluffiness to whey protein. It does not have to be listed on the protein powder as bird feathers are included in here. Okay, um, But if you were to see the USP seal on whey protein powder, you can ensure that exactly what is on the supplement label is exactly what is in the powder and you, there's nothing deceiving or hidden. Before we get into prebiotics and probiotics, I want to talk about gastrointestinal microbes or microbes. I want you to know that a healthy gastrointestinal tract or digestive system is home to a vibrant community of some hundred trillion microbes, which um, include bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and other microorganisms collectively known as the GI microbiota of the body. And then recent research has revealed that the GI microbiota or microbiome may play a critical role in health. Changes in the microbiota composition and activity are associated with dozens of common diseases such as irritable bowel syndrome and obesity. I also want you to know that change to your microbiota changes in response to diet. Um, so it can change in response to what you eat, both in the short term, like daily meals and long term, like habitual diet patterns. And I'll, I want you to know that in fact, one of the ways um, diet may help manage uh, diseases is by changing the microbiota or the microbiota. Consider, for example, let me give you an example that most recommended diet strategy to improve health, for example, plant-based eating patterns promotes the most favorable changes in the GI microbiota. Usually because these diets are high in fiber and that cannot be digested by the human body, but these fibers provide a major source of energy for the bacteria that fosters their growth. 
Um, and this bacteria that fosters the growth is the probiotics. So these prebiotics, you guys, pre happens before. These prebiotics are usually foods that feed the probiotics, all those living microorganisms in your gut. Okay, so if you ever heard of good bacteria, they include some of the good bacteria. Um, and I want you to know that a gastrointestinal tract, so your digestive system, um, as GI bacteria digest and metabolize fibers, they do produce short fragments of fat, which influence metabolism, inflammation, and disease. And these actions that I just explained, uh, they may help explain how dietary fibers protect against colon cancer. So um, some species of bacteria cause disease. Uh, so I want you to know that microorganisms uh, on the slide, they're living organisms and they can, um, they can be pathogenic, like cause diseases, or they could just be helpful microorganisms like probiotics, which are healthy bacteria in your gut, okay? Prebiotics and probiotics continue. So I want you to know that um, Fibers and some other food components are called prebiotics because they encourage the growth and activity of bacteria. And they're basically the food. Uh, prebiotics are food that feeds the probiotics, the living organisms in the gut. So they are not live, um, whereas probiotics are live. Research suggests that prebiotics may reduce the risk of GI or gastrointestinal infections, again, inflammation and disorders. Also, they may increase the bioavailability of nutrients and regulate appetite and satiety. And um, a little bit about probiotics before I reveal some things. The probiotics are the live microbes or microorganisms in your body that can change the conditions in the GI tract in ways that seem to benefit health. For example, yogurt with its live bacterial strains have been used for thousands of years for its health-promoting properties, okay? Um, the potential GI health benefits of probiotics or products of their metabolism include helping to elevate diarrhea, constipation, inflammatory bowel syndrome, ulcers, allergies, and lactose intolerance, and infant colic um, condition. Um, also enhance immune function as well. So prebiotics, again, are the food or these intestinal fertilizers. They're non-digestible carbohydrates like the fibers that feed your live organisms, the probiotics in your gut. They serve as food to promote the growth of beneficial microorganisms in the small intestine and colon. An example is probiotics. Uh, again, probiotics are your friendly or good bacteria, and there are live microorganisms found in the colon or large intestine, and they feed off the prebiotics. And some foods high in prebiotics include uh, foods with fiber, like chic chicory root, artichoke, um, and also um, if you ever heard of kefir and certain yogurts as well. Probiotics um, are also found in foods in such as sauerkraut, fermented foods like sauerkraut, um, kimchi, just to name a few, and uh, kombucha. They resist digestion, and when administered in adequate amounts of appropriate strains, they confer health benefits to the health that I just explained. Continued, so strains like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria are the best known probiotics, and you often will find them on supplement labels listed as such. Pre and probiotics are regulated by the same rules that govern other dietary supplements. Symbiotics are a combination of prebiotics and probiotics benefiting the health of the host and are sold together sometimes in supplemental form. The breakdown, the breakdown products from microorganism digestion are released into the gut. So again, the uh, eating uh, prebiotics, uh, the effects of it are released into the gut for the microorganisms that are called probiotics to feed off of them. These products foster growth of beneficial bacteria or good bacteria and diminish the population of harmful microorganisms. Benefits. So let's um, go over some of the benefits of prebiotics and probiotics. Some of you are already hinting yourselves as to what that is um, because of what I explained um, in the former slides. Increasing mass of beneficial bacteria. Decreasing mass of harmful microorganisms. Decreasing insulin resistance and chronic inflammation in the body. Enhancing the immune functions of the small intestine and the colon or the large intestine. Decreasing the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome and infantile, infant or infantile colic. Continuing, um, these are all from your book that can enhance the absorption of minerals such as calcium, magnesium, and iron. 
They can decrease the symptoms and onset of vaginal and urinary tract infections, delaying the onset of allergy development in children. Some gut health, poor gut health, um, has also been linked to a higher risk of allergies in children, decreasing the duration of infections and antibiotic use related to diarrhea, increasing stole bulk or feces bulk and reducing constipation. Um, again, uh, food and other sources of prebiotics. So if you want uh, for the test, you do have to be able to identify some sources of prebiotics and probiotics, and you should uh, look at your book. For an example, prebiotics are often those um, fibers that we find in foods like in wheat, barley, rye, onions, garlic, leeks, um, and so on, oats and banana. Whereas probiotics are often found in cheeses, yogurt, so a lot of these dairy products, um, also fermented, more fermented food like um, sauerkraut um, and then powders as well. And uh, kombucha, just to name some that are not in your book. Final thoughts. Um, so from dietary supplements to friendly bacteria, I want you to know that the universe of substances considered dietary ingredients is expanding. So I want you to know that it's important that knowledge about potential benefits of pre and probiotics is charging ahead and advances are catching the attention of consumers and health professionals. Perhaps as a student, you never thought that the intestinal fertilizer or friendly bacteria would ever intentionally pass through your lips, but that may well be the nature of some dietary ingredients to come. Other final thoughts is uh, consider uh, the benefits to health and strain dose specification or specific Products uh, are not regulated by the FDA, uh, and you can read on. Uh, use may cause temporary gas and bloating. Again, some fibers do ferment, so they cause bloating in the stomach. Effects last as long as a probiotic is consumed, and benefits are usually modest and should generally not replace conventional therapy. And individuals who are critically ill or have severe immune systems should not use them.